now, or do we have time? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Karen Elizari is going to come up next. Um, she's a, an awesome speaker. Uh, she spoke for us last year. She spoke at DEF CON last year. She's spoken at several TED conferences. So I think you're going to be really excited. And uh, she's got something special to say at the very end. So make sure you stick around. Yeah, there'll be little surprises throughout the day. But uh... Listen, guys and girls, while we get set up, it's going to take me a minute with the cables and stuff. I want to offer you a chance to have some exercise. So there's upgrades to first class today. Lots of seats in the front row. You see the talk. You'll enjoy it more. And uh, you know, just get up, move around, stretch your legs, move your shit. I might be amusing, but it's not a stand-up. So I'm not going to make fun of the people in the first row. So I promise I won't make fun of you if you come and sit in the front. You're very welcome. Feel free. And I have another request, a housekeeping request. Can we keep the door just open and have people come in and out? Because it's way more distracting to hear that people trying to close the door and not, you know, failing at closing the door. So let's just put this here, and I'm going to let the magicians take care of that stuff. I'll get mic'd up in a second. Here's the clicker also. Um, and uh, there's going to be something pretty special happening at the last couple minutes of the talk. So y'all want to be sticking around for that because it's something never before seen and never to be seen again, maybe. So, <laughs> all right. Um, you get that stuff set up. Looking good, looking good. Um, mic. I need a loud mic. Yeah, let me. Thank you so much. One, two, three, testing. One, two, three. Guys at the back row, Martin, can you hear me? Are you hearing me from? No, you can't hear me. It's not coming out. Okay, how about now? How about now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You feeling good? You hearing me in the back row, everyone? Because I'm going to speak loud so we can have the door open and you're all going to hear me, even if you're all the way in the back row. So I need the people at the back row to let me know if they're hearing me or not. Yes, you are? Okay. Uh, another second to get this stuff set up. I need this stuff. Power plug is good. Yeah, that's going to be there. Okay. If I need what? Let's just plug it in then. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And the audio is going to come into here. So we need to have the audio coming into here. So we have audio, but it's at the very end. Yeah. Oh, can you connect it, man? Thank you. <laughs> OK, guys. Uh, and is this the way the projector is supposed to look like, which is a trapezoid shape? Sort of trapezoid shape? OK. OK, let me get over here. Yes, good, good. Yes, good. This is working, OK. Um, we, we test the, the sound later. OK, guys and girls, boys and ladies, gentlemen, and creatures of other genders, kinds, types, and races, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm extremely excited to be here today. And it's actually uh, not because I love hackers and B-sides and Vegas. It's actually because I was nearly blown up on the way over. So uh, this is not a, a mock picture. Actually, I was on this flight, TK-79 flight from Istanbul to San Francisco. Uh, this flight had an actual bomb threat, and uh, we had to do an emergency landing. We had the jets escorting us over Poland. We dumped all the fuel. It's a 777 heavy coming over the Atlantic, so it had to get rid of all the fuel before we could do the emergency landing. Uh, the captain of the flight made the decision to do the emergency landing. Uh, it was kind of freaky. I was kind of, uh, you know, very nervous about it. And we had the fire trucks and the Polish SWAT teams and the dogs sniffing out, and all that, you know, the whole that circus happening on the jet, um, on the jetway in Poland. So, and all of this happened not because of uh, somebody hacking into the airplane. It happened because the captain actually thought it was an ISIS bomb. Uh, they found a cell phone on the plane, and the captain made the decision. You don't have to, I mean, you can make an airplane crashing if you like, but you don't have to. I make a caricature of it. Anyway, this is the reason I'm actually very, very happy to be here, because the captain actually thought it was an ISIS bomb and made a decision to do the emergency landing. It's the first time that's ever happened to me. If it's ever happened to you, I hope it never does. It's very scary. So I'm very happy to be here today 
because I am alive and I didn't get blown up to pieces. Uh, however, when I got into Vegas, to add insult to injury, uh, somebody stole my bags. And uh, I don't know if it's the DHS, the FBI, the Fed, other you know, three-letter agencies, uh, but all they took was my deodorant and my um, backup SD cards. And everything else was intact. So either it's a plot to disrupt the odorants at DEF CON, or it's a plot to disrupt other stuff. I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess we'll find out, and maybe I can find my deodorant as well. Uh, if not, I hope I'm OK smelling. So uh, here's the thing. Planes, this is actually, it, it really happened to me, but this story ties into what I'm talking about today. Planes flying over the ocean is a real thing. And they can actually still get blown up, not because of you know United or because of Chris Roberts, <laughs> poor guy or you know great guy, and you know lots of compliments and, and other superlatives. Uh, actually, planes still get you know threats and real bomb threats and get blown up. And this really ties into what I want to talk to you all about today. Actually, um, I'm jump right in there. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it, but I want to talk to you about how. Our world is made up of bits and atoms, right? That's kind of clear. I think it's a statement kind of clear. And for the past 20 years in information security, we've been all about protecting bits, data, right? Bits and bytes and information and that kind of stuff. Now, um, did that just auto move? Because I didn't move it. Okay, I have to watch out. My slides have a mind of their own. This guy is Nick Negro Negroponte from the MIT Media Lab. 20 years ago, he wrote a book called Being Digital. And he said one thing which stuck with everyone. He said, in 20 years, it's not going to be about the atoms and the molecules. It's all going to be about the bits and the bytes. And in a way, I think we can agree that you know, he's got a point there. But guess what? We still have the atoms. And actually, now we have more bits controlling more atoms. So that's very abstract. But what I mean is that we have more ways to use information to disrupt physical reality. And that's why I like what I am the cavalry is doing, because I think it's all about the physical stuff. It's all about the physical, cybernetic you know, uh, atoms that could ruin your day. Of course, bits could still ruin your day. If uh, you are uh, a member of the Ashley Medicine dating community, I don't know if you all heard about this. Uh, this happened last week, I think. I was actually on CNN right after this moment talking to Brooke Baldwin at Newsroom. She actually introduced me as a cyber hacker. That's the first time that's happened to me. So I now you know put in my intro. Once called cyber hacker on CNN, I think uh, maybe that's why they stole my luggage. Anyway, uh, Ashley Madison dating site. You don't know it, maybe uh, their tagline says it all: "Life is short, have an affair." Life is short, have an affair. They have 37 million anonymous users. Turned out not so anonymous after all. So yes, bits could still ruin your life. Information could still your still ruin your life. Secret stuff could still your, ruin your life. And you know, um, Sony Pictures had a massive leak last year. Pretty terrible stuff for the Hollywood industry, but pretty great for Charlize Theron, uh, Academy Award nominated actress, because she was able to negotiate a fair fee, uh, an equal fee for her next uh, gig starring in Mad Max, if you haven't seen a great movie, because she saw in the emails leaked from Sony that she was not getting paid the same way as the guy actors. So these leaks, what they tell us is that secrets are going to get out there at some point, And it could ruin somebody's day, but it also could do some good stuff. And that brings me to why people are so afraid of hackers. Us. We are hackers. And what happens is that a lot of the times, the shit that we do shatters people's illusion. People think they're living in a safe world. They think they have privacy. They think they have secrets. And whether their secrets are on Ashley Madison, or they're on Gmail, or on, you know, wherever their secrets are, actually, I don't think they have any secrets from these guys. Because these guys don't charge money for the service, right? You don't pay to use Facebook, WhatsApp, or Instagram. What you pay with is your information. You pay with your choices, your decisions, the stuff that you do, the places you go to, the people you like, the people you don't like, all of that stuff. That's actually worth a ton of money. The movies you, you, you enjoy watching and interacting with, actually, did you know that if you upload something to YouTube, it kind of belongs to them? And it's, it's kind of crazy if you look into the rules of what it means when you upload video to there. So all of this is happening because if you're on the internet and you're not paying for something, there are good chances you are the product, right? Have you all heard this one before? Maybe some of you, OK. Are you aliens? Are you awake? Yes, some of you? Good. 
All right, so basically this is all happening because of what uh, our good friend Miko Hippenen likes to say. Oh, look, I have a fire, fire thing in the middle of my slides. I just realized this. Is there a way we can move a little bit the projector so it's not on this, or can you see it okay? You can see it okay. So I have read and accepted the terms of use. This is probably the biggest lie on the interwebs because nobody has read and accepted. I mean, nobody has read them. They just accept it. They click through. Even us who are hackers and, you know, minded individuals, we never read these terms of use anyway. Now I have a sister who is a lawyer, and she tells me about this stuff. And she says, you know what? It's crazy, the stuff you're all accepting. She's not a hacker. She's a, she's a lawyer, like I said. And she's, she's done her uh, master's thesis only about the stuff that we are all agreeing to do. So we're agreeing to do some crazy stuff. And this is uh, what Miko Hippen from F-Secure calls the biggest lie on the interwebs. And basically, here's the reality. Our information is worth a lot of money. Everybody's information is worth a lot of money. And maybe, maybe we don't really have a lot of secrets anymore. Not us, not the other people. So really, maybe the future of cybersecurity is not about secret information. It's not about keeping things secret. It's not about privacy. Or it's not just about privacy and secrecy. And no, this is a little bit of a uh, controversial claim here. But you know, stick with me for a little, a little while more, have a coffee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest also the flip side of that safe statement. If there are no more secrets and if our information is wor worth a lot of money, and it's worth a lot of money to the big guys, governments and corps, it also means that with the power of releasing information, you know, one person, maybe a couple of people, can change the world. They can influence governments. They can maybe uh, take down a corrupt uh, corporate or you know, uh, help Charlize Theron get an equal pay in her next movie, which is great for Hollywood actresses. So maybe, maybe, just maybe in a few years, in this reality where there are no more secrets, maybe with the help of some hackers, the governments and the corporates will be as transparent and as exposed to us as we are to them. Maybe. It's one idea. And as you all know, uh, this is something I, I mention a lot. About 100 years ago, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis, here in the United States, he said that there is no better disinfectant than the light of day. And that releasing information is a cure for many social illnesses. And I very much like that, that idea 100 years ago, but I think it still makes sense. So it's not about secrets. It's about a way of life. It's about our atoms. It's about the things that we're going to trust. So I just wanted to get all that information and secrecy stuff out of the way before we move into the physical stuff. And the physical stuff could be one of these boats, $80 million super yachts you know, sailing on the Adriatic Sea. Stop me if you've heard this one before. You all heard this one before? No. OK, $80 million super yacht about a team of researchers from a University of Austin, Texas, using some GPS spoofing and a laptop worth like a 1000 bucks can send it veering off course. So it is bits controlling atoms, information controlling physical reality. And it's the same stuff, the same stuff that they used to take this yacht off course, same stuff they used to crash land the drone. And it's not new stuff. They did it a few years ago at the university, like I said, University of Austin in Texas. So what is happening here? With a thousand bucks, you can take down a thousand bucks worth of fiberglass or eighty million dollar worth of fiberglass. That's a little bit scary. So why is this happening? It is happening, I think, because of two reasons. One is convergence, and the second is multiplicity. And I will explain. When I talk about convergence, for years people told us that very soon we're going to have one device that does everything. You know, you've probably seen those images of how people used to have like a camera, an MP3 player, and a personal digital assistant, and I don't know, like a fax machine, and now it's all in your iPhone, or something like that. So everything is converging, the technology is all coming together, and we are told that this is, you know, going to keep happening. So at some point we're only going to have one operating system, you know, one major computer programming language, but this is actually bullshit. There's actually more and more and more stuff and more and more types of technologies being connected and created every day. So it's not convergent at all. It's actually um, very diverse. Uh, but at the same time, we still have a lot of core things which are shared among everyone, and these are very vulnerable things. And what do I mean by that? Uh, thank you all, uh, by the way, for, for joining this uh, session. I hope I'm making some sense because my brain has been very frazzled and I've been on a bomb threat and coffee and jet lag and it's like the perfect storm in my brain right now. So I'm happy that actually there are people here. <sighs> okay, let me ask you all, 
You all came over from all kinds of parts of the world. You all speak a few languages, I'd imagine. What would you think is the most popular language in the galaxy right now? Mandarin? I heard another one? Cobol. Cobol, OK. <laughs> good one, good one. Other guesses? C++. C++. So actually, guys and ladies, Math, well, math is good, but it's kind of abstract. So I'm actually, you're right, but it's kind of abstract. So I'm actually talking about software language, not a big surprise there. And it's more popular than Mandarin and English combined. And this is, of course, Java. So Java is on billions of devices. God help us all. We, yeah, God help us all. And this sheet has been around for years, and we're still finding like zero days, like every moment. And this stuff is not running like on laptops and web apps, right? It's running like ATMs and medical devices and cars. It's freaking running the Java, the Mars Curiosity rover on Mars. I mean, it's part of the OS. It's not the only thing running it, but it's part of the OS. So it is convergent. Everybody's using Java, but it's used for like a bunch of multiply different stuff. So can we protect robots on Mars the same way we protect mobile apps? Is it the same kind of mindset? I'm not sure. So this is like where the problem gets really complex. It's not just about information. It's not just about secrets. It's about the safety of this shit, which is a laser, ro you know, laser firing robot on Mars. And it's, you know, tweeting about it. So it's also about the safety of its Twitter feed. Same thing, but all using Java. But the problems are different. So I hope this brings to home the complexity of the problem that I'm trying to, to bring through here. And all of this stuff, these are the past, um, in the past 25 years, this is what Sourcefire have uh, released in a report a couple years ago. They looked at 25 years of vulnerabilities. These are the most, uh, the environments in which most severe bugs were found. So, of course, you could say it's the most popular ones. People find the bugs there. They don't look at the un unpopular stuff. Well, maybe that could be true, but we're still using this stuff, and a lot of it is very, very vulnerable, and we're still using, finding more and more bugs. Even though we've been had 25 years of finding bugs in this stuff, we're still finding more bugs. And now, all of this shit is connected to this new shit, an old shit. Uh, pardon my French, by the way. <laughs> Sorry if I'm hurting anyone's feelings with my, uh, yes? Your feelings. Ian Amit. Oh, you're so, you're so gentle. You're a kind white rose in the middle of the desert. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Have a drink, get over it. So, uh, this new stuff and old stuff, you know, GSM is not new, GPS is not new, RFID is not so much new. You know, this stuff is not very much new. Some of it is old, but it's connected in new ways. Never before connected in new ways to stuff running this stuff. So this is the complexity of the problem I'm talking about. It's not about secrets. It's about bits controlling atoms. I think I'm starting to get the message through to you guys. And of course, we have all kinds of vulnerabilities every day and all kinds of you know, poodles and shell shocks and heart bleeds and you know, stuff they haven't found a cool name and a logo for yet. I'm actually waiting to see if Marvel is going to do a superhero movie where the characters are software vulnerabilities. Because if they can give the lead part to a, like a raccoon in a tree, and you know, I think Heartbleed deserves its own movie. You know, so. yeah. Here's hoping, right? So uh, I actually recently, oh, maybe. Oh, it's a, oh, it's Bandit. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the talk, honey. He's so sweet. Uh, that's Grant's baby, baby Grant, Grant's baby. Hey, hello, hello. Um, it's very. It's actually the first time I had a baby in the talk. I mean, not had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, it might be amusing, but I'm not going to make fun of you guys, don't worry. Uh, OK, so we keep finding bugs. Bugs will be around. As long as humans write code and create technology, we'll have more and more bugs. And actually, companies are under severe pressure to put new technology out there faster than ever before and connect it to a bunch of other stuff. So if there is no way, even if they had the best intentions in mind, even if they had like a fantastic security team, even if they didn't have governments forcing them to put back doors in it, there is just no way they're going to secure all the things. It's just not going to happen. It would be naive of us to expect this to happen. And this is why the world needs hackers. This is why the world needs hackers. Because governments and companies and the people running all of these technologies they might find some of this stuff, and even if they're really kind-hearted and you know, they want to make this stuff secure and they don't want to put any backdoors in it, well, guess what? There's still going to be a couple of those. So that's where hackers come into the pictures, and, and I think that's like basically only hackers can actually 
be that solution. So this is an idea I previously uh, discussed and called it the immune system for the technology age or the internet. I think hackers are a part of the immune system. It's about finding the problems and making, you know, making the problems go away by sparking a solution. Barnaby Jack said sometimes we have to demonstrate a threat to spark a solution. I'm very much inspired by that. I think that's very much uh, you know, within the spirit of I am the cavalry. Uh, but I also want to, you know, I want to go back to that in a second. So this is an idea I actually presented last year at uh, something called TED. And uh, maybe you've heard about this event. It's a little bit of a big deal for me because the people on stage were like Bill Gates and, and Snowden via a robot and me. So that was weird. But look, I almost got it to say lit. So I almost got the view count to say lit. Now, I have to say I didn't mess with the view count. It's totally organic. And I guess at some point it did say lit. But uh, you know, I was very hopeful uh, to get the message out. It looks like it did get out. So my message about hackers being the immune system kind of became viral in its own spirit. If you go to RSA or Blacka, you'll see five different companies talking about the immune system of the internet, uh, which is you know, good and bad. I don't know. I think hackers are the immune system of the internet and not like a security company. Uh, but uh, I can't sue them for you know, spreading this idea onwards, because that's kind of counterproductive. So I want, I want to go back to something which I think is important to all of us. I think everybody is thinking and talking about this Jeep hacking stuff. Right? And it's so complicated to even talk about without offending anyone's feelings. I just want to say one thing about what is sometimes called um, stunt hacking. Okay? I don't think it's a bad thing, personally. I think it has some impact. Uh, but I think one of, you know, probably the biggest impact of this stuff is that for people outside of our world, they start prioritizing control and trust and safety of like the atoms over the privacy and the secrets of the bits. And maybe it's OK that they prioritize this stuff for a little bit, because the atoms have not had the same amount of attention as the bits that we as an industry have been giving them. However, uh, you know, to put things in perspective, I don't think it's just about atoms or just about bits. Or to make it even more clear, we cannot choose one or the other. right? We cannot just choose to protect this stuff and not protect this stuff. It is connected inherently in a way that will never be separated. We're only going to get more wired and more connected, and this stuff is going to be like on the moon and Mars, and you know, but here in my pocket. It's all the same stuff. And so what can we do about it? A few things I suggest we can do before we move on to the more exciting part of today's presentation, which is going to happen in a couple of minutes, something pretty special. Uh, a few things we can do. We think about the atoms, not about the secrets. We keep thinking about them, and this is what I am the cavalry is pushing forward protecting the physical reality stuff. I think it's critical that we talk about it all the time. I sure talk about it all the time. And we try and find all the bugs. Like we help work, do what we can to make more bugs known. Because we got to make the bugs known. There's no better disinfectant than the light of day. right? This is very important. And think about an ecosystem. Think about the fact that there's no islands in cybersecurity. Maybe Richard Branson, the guy who started Virgin, maybe he has a private island to which he flies with a private jet. And he makes all his calls on his private Virgin mobile network, which he owns. And you know he has everything set up privately. That's one guy. For the rest of us, we've got to figure this shit out. Unless you, know, you, you know, become one of Richard Branson's slaves, guests at the island, and uh, then you're good to go. Um, <laughs> I, I was actually offered a trip to this uh, island. It exists. Uh, they have a Bitcoin conference happening there. Uh, I declined politely. So this is us, guys. This is how the world sees us. And you know what? It's kind of scary, but it's also how we got to be. We got to be armed to the teeth. We got to be working together. We got to be you know, making a difference in the world. And we also got to make other people be like us or understand us. And we got to take this very scary image, which I put in Lego to make it a little bit less scary. OK, actually, somebody else made the image. I didn't make it. but you know. Lego people are less scary. So maybe if we are like this, but we are Lego people, people can relate to us more. I hope that makes sense. Now, <laughs> before we move on, uh, I want to just bring home one last point. It's really up to us here in this room. The cavalry is not coming. We are it. We totally are it. So guys, uh, that's a big responsibility. The future is all already here. This stuff is already happening. It really is about us if we can save this future uh, or not. So um, thank you for listening and participating. No, no applause yet, please. 
I want to ask you if you want to see the next part. So, oh, I just realized I totally skipped my introduction about who I am. Well, you don't need to know that. I mean, you can Google it or something. I don't have a Wikipedia page, but you can figure it out. So, I'm actually, a lot of, yeah, I guess, uh, a lot of what I am about is because of this woman. And I think for a lot of people, it's like this. Angelina Jolie in 1995 film, Hackers, as Acid Burn. I was 14 when I saw this movie, and I was inspired, just deeply inspired. Keep the door open, guys. Just keep the door open. I'll speak up loudly. Keep the door open. Thank you. It's very distracting. The, you need WD-40 on the door. You know what it is? OK. Uh, so this woman inspired me to be like a hacker and to think about it as something which is a good thing. I never for a minute, when I saw this movie, I never for a minute thought the hackers are the bad guys. I only thought the hackers were heroes. And that's what I keep thinking for the past 20 years. So this movie has done you know, quite a lot of impact. You can make fun of it, or you can admire it like I do, but the movie has made an impact. Angelina Jolie has made an impact on the cybersecurity industry, I think an undeniable impact. And so this movie just had its 20th anniversary. And I had a crazy idea a few hours ago actually uh, 72 hours ago, somewhere in Sebastopol in Northern California, where I was camping out with a bunch of hackers at something called Foo Camp, which is an unconference. And I came out there, and I just had a crazy idea. I realized, hey, it's 20 years for hackers. Let's do something cool. Let's make a fan version of Hackers from 1995. And this is a fan version in the spirit of what is called Sweding a movie. If you don't understand this, it's from a Michel Gondry film called Be Kind, Rewind, where they actually ha have a video library, and they lose all the videos. And they have to recreate the videos themselves because people want to rent Ghostbusters. So they recreate Ghostbusters with aluminum foil in the library. And they call it the Swedish version of the movie, and it becomes more popular than all of the other stuff. So we tried to make a Swedish version, which means it's a mashup, cover, version, redo, you know, remix. Uh, it might make more sense than the original plot, it might not. Um, there were a lot of people involved, actually like 30 people involved. Some of these names you will recognize, and I'm going to let you, I mean, I suggest you stick around for the credits roll at the end of the film that we may see in a minute, because there's a lot of people you might know and love or hate, you know. Um, spoiler? No, no spoiler. You know what? I'll let you find out for yourself. Uh, just before I screen this to you guys, I want to say this is a, like, totally a labor of love that these 30 people made happen in 24 freaking hours between Friday night and Saturday night after I nearly got blown up on a plane. So if it's kind of crazy, you know, bear with us. It's wacky, I think. Uh, maybe it's adorable. Who knows? It's never before seen footage, and it will never before, uh, never after be seen again unless it gets leaked, uh, I mean uploaded, to the interwebs. Uh, but at this point, my friend at the console, hello, I'm speaking to you, I need to stop the video filming. So thank you all for watching. <laughs>